Hey guys, Miss Peterson here, and welcome to a Physics in the Universe lecture on Kepler's Laws. Here we're going to be putting together what we know about circular motion with what we learn know about universal gravitation to apply it to satellites and moons and planets and any object orbiting in space. So let's start with the basics. How do the planets stay in orbit? Okay, well, we know that when a planet is in orbit, it is constantly falling towards the planet. It is the force of gravity, okay, that is acting as their centripetal force, okay? So when the force of gravity is exactly enough to just cause it to turn, to accelerate towards that middle, then it's perfect. If the object is going too fast, okay, the force of gravity isn't strong enough, then it'll fly off and won't maintain its orbit. Where if it's going too slow, then that force of gravity could be too strong and it could crash into whatever it's orbiting. So there's a perfect balance between the orbital velocity, the speed a planet or satellite needs to go, and the radius of its orbit. So let me show you where that comes from, okay? We're gonna start by this basic equation, setting that force of gravity equal to the centripetal force. Then we're gonna go ahead and plug in what we know those equations are. Universal gravity is G, and then I'm gonna talk about it in terms of sun and planet. So I will use ms for my sun and mp for my planet. So I have G times the mass of the sun times the mass of the planet, divided by the radius between them squared equals for centripetal velocity it's mv squared over r and if you remember right the m is the mass of the orbiting object in that equation so it would be the mass of the planet okay now let's do some algebra to figure out what that velocity needs to be we can see that the mass of the okay, planets okay. Just to try again. we can see that the mass of the planets will cancel out and then if I rewrite this r squared as r times r, I can also cancel out one of those r's, which leaves me with this v squared. So in order to undo the square, I need to take the square root of both sides, which leaves us with the equation that the velocity of an object in orbit equals the square root of big G times m over r, where we have V, that is going to be your orbital velocity. R will be the radius of the orbit. Okay, the planet canceled out. So this M is going to be the mass of the center object. And of course, G is the universal gravitation constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newton meter squared per kilogram squared so since those are the units that we use for g when we talk about our mass here it will need to be in kilograms and the radius in meters leaving our velocity in meters per second okay so that's our orbital velocity equation and will be one of our main equations for this unit so let's talk about kepler's laws Okay, the first law is a pretty basic one. All planets orbit, object, all planets orbit in ellipses. So ellipses include circles and ovals. Okay, the eccentricity is basically how oval it is versus how circle it is. And if that planet is orbiting the sun or whatever they are orbiting needs to be at one of those focal points. Okay, that's Kepler's first law. Kepler's second law is that, that a radius vector will sweep out equal areas in equal times. Now, that's pretty funky, so let me show you what I mean by that. We know that we can think about the velocity as the distance over time. So what it's saying is if we have these two areas here, and if area one equals area two area, equals area two, then the time one will equal the time two. So since this distance is lower, okay, 
and we want those times to be equal, if you have a lower amount of distance, you can go slower. So planets move slower when they are farther from their star. That is the effect of Kepler's second law. Okay, when an object is closer to its sun, it is going to be moving faster. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Now, last but not least, Kepler's third law. So Kepler's third law is actually a proportionality. And what it says is that the ratio of the orbital period squared, so T squared over R cubed is a constant. Okay, for all planets orbiting a certain star. So I am going to show you this derivation and where it comes from. But typically when we use this equation, we'll use it, um, or when we use this law, we'll use it in the context of a graph and just that proportionality. As that radius increases, the period increases. Okay, pretty straightforward. But where it comes from is we know the velocity is the distance, that circumference of its orbit, divided by the period, the time from one orbit, and we saw in the first slide of this lecture that we can calculate the orbital velocity of something where gravity is acting as the centripetal force as gm over r. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set these two equations equal to each other to show you where this proportionality comes from. This is not an equation that we're going to actually be using um, in this class, but it's important to see kind of where this relationship comes from and it's some good practice with algebraic derivations. So those two velocities are the same because it's the velocity of the planet. I'm going to set them equal to each other. So then we have 2 pi r over t equals the square root of gm over r. Okay. And again, I'm trying to show you where this proportionality comes from. So we're going to do some algebra. First thing, I'm going to get rid of that square root by squaring the whole equation. So 2 squared is 4 pi squared r squared over t squared, and then that squared just gets rid of the square root. So that equals g m over r. Okay, so a little bit more algebra here. I'm going to cross multiply, which gives me, I'm just going to kind of, or I can do it down here, gives me 4 pi squared r cubed equals g m t squared. Okay. So combining like terms to try to show this constant, the t squared divided by r squared, okay, so t squared over r cubed divided by r cubed would be equal to that 4 pi squared divided by g m, okay? So you can see here that g is the universal gravitation constant, m is the mass of the central object, so if they're all orbiting the same object, okay, none of these variables are, are going to change, which means this ratio wouldn't change either. Okay, how we'll use it is that typically we'll use the transit light curves so that we get the orbital period, and then we can use that to find what its radius would be. Okay, let's go ahead and apply these and see how it works in an example problem. So here we have the International Space Station, or ISS, it's in a low Earth orbit about the Earth at an altitude of about 440 kilometers above Earth's surface. So how fast is it going? How fast does it need to travel to maintain this orbit? Okay, well, let's make sense of what we're talking about first. We have Earth, and then we have the ISS. And it's telling us that it orbits at an altitude so I'll say A for altitude there, I guess, or H for height of orbit, okay? Yeah, I like H for height of orbit. Let's do that, okay? We use H for height of orbit, and then this is the radius of the Earth, okay? And that's important, because though we have H equals 440 kilometers, I'm going to go ahead and convert that to meters real quick. One kilometer is 1,000 meters. So we have four, or I was right. 440,000 meters, okay? When we talk about the radius of the orbit, the radius of the orbit will need to be the radius of Earth plus the height of that orbit, 
Okay, we have to add them together because when we do the radius of the orbit, it's center to center. So you get that full distance around it. Okay, Earth matters. It's going around the Earth. We can't ignore that height. Um, so I'm just going to be adding the radius of Earth to that. Okay, plugging it into my calculator. Don't forget to use that EE or scientific notation button, EXP, whatever it is on your calculator. And when we, oopsies, I multiplied them instead of added them, add them, we get the radius of the orbit is 6.81 times 10 to the sixth meters. Okay, now if we're looking for how fast it needs to go, this is one of those situations where gravity is acting as the centripetal force. And anytime gravity is acting as that centripetal force, we can use V equals the square root of GM over R as our equation. So I'm going to go ahead and plug in the numbers. G is the universal gravitation constant, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 Newton meter squared per kilogram squared times the mass of the Earth, the central body that it is orbiting, 5.98 times 10 to the 24th. It's important that the mass of the space shuttle doesn't matter for how fast it needs to go. Otherwise, we would have to like adjust the weights every time we restocked or sent a new astronaut or got back an astronaut. Very convenient that it's only the mass of Earth that matters and not the mass of the satellite. Okay, divided by r, which is the radius of the orbit. So 6.81 times 10 to the sixth meters. Okay, and then you can see here how one of the meters, um, oh, and the, yep, the meters here cancels out with the one of the meters there. The kilograms here cancels out with the squared kilograms there. Um, and then, how does that force cancel out? Uh, we would have to consider that a newton is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So then the meter squared would cancel out and the kilogram, one of the kilograms would cancel out. And then the newton would cancel out and we would just have meters squared per second squared under that square root. Okay, don't get too caught up in the units as long as you're using the right units. If we're talking about speed, it's always going to be in meters per second. Okay, so let me plug this into my calculator, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11, times 5.98, times 10 to the 24th, divided by 6.81, times 10 to the 6th. That's a good reason to use the scientific notation button on your calculator rather than typing times 10 and caret, is because uh, then your calculator knows to treat it as one number and not two, oper two different numbers um, or two different operations. So it tends to do order of operations a little bit better. So we take, divide it and then we take the square root of that and we get 7,653.145 whatever seconds. So we round it based on sig figs. Okay, in all of our given numbers we had three or like two digits. So um, the 440 was our least precise one. So I'll go ahead and round this to two digits. Okay. This was probably rounded, I don't know if it's 41 or 42 or 39. So I know it's about 40. So I know the speed of the object in orbit will be about 7,650. Uh, but yeah, we'll just go with that. 7,650 meters per second. Okay. If we were being really strict on sig figs and rather than going with three, you wanted to go with two here, um, you could also round it to just 7,700 and that would be just as correct, okay? Because with 440, I'm not sure if that zero is a known one or if it was an estimated. I'm guessing it was their estimated digit. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So let's go ahead and see what these laws look like conceptually. Okay, we're going to be looking at the satellites of Earth in an animation. So during the first part, I want you to look at how the orbits vary in shape. What do you notice about the velocities? Do they vary in speed? Do the speeds vary? And what general patterns can you notice about those that are close versus those that are far? Okay, we'll do that first and then we'll come back to focus on that subset. So let's see what's going on here. Play. So 
So we have tons of satellites, all of our GPS, all of our communication, not to mention things like the International Space Station. So you can see that in general, these ones out on the outside are going slower, where once they come into the middle, they're going a lot faster. Now we're looking at that 